Lives end all the time. Some fairly easily, some horrifically. <music> Greetings, owners of fine luxury cardboard rectangles. Welcome to my video about eight horrific ways to go in Magic the Gathering. Now, we're going to have a very particular focus with this. This one was inspired by a guild's of Ravnica card that's upcoming so we may as well start with that because that makes the most sense in this case sometimes you want to build to it but in this case we're going to dive right in and take a look at the card so what you get is two black three color sorcery destroy target creature with surveil two and for those of you who don't know that's a new ability that did not exist previously before this set look at the basically you surveil for x look at the top x cards of your library then put any number of them into your graveyard that's the ability on this card obviously it's four two so it's very similar to scry but different in a way i like it it's an information gathering sort of concept so the artwork behind this is very evocative i enjoy the artwork the the sorcery style there's different st there's like different styles different speeds of creature kill so you have this Deadly Visit, which is clearly shown as an assassination attempt, right? That's that's basically what's going down. Not an attempt either. It, obviously, a successful assassination. Because this this individual here is somebody who matters, who's being taken out. This isn't, this isn't like a random murder. This is essentially an assassination that's going down. Now, I really enjoy this caught unawares concept where you take a look at the artwork and you can see that there is the assassin in the background clearly half shrouded behind those billowing curtains one hand outreached to move that curtain aside and come in with that curved blade in their hand now i assume that's a poisoned blade we're looking at the assassination of most likely a high-ranking military official looking at just the armor overall cleanliness of him and the fact that he's probably reading a military dispatch right there that's probably some sort of intel that will be represented by their surveil you know surveillance kind of thing so conceptually i really enjoy how the art transmits the concept of eliminating a target that matters and gaining information as a result i like the the contrast of the deadly peril behind and in front just the sort of chill like he has even a cup of tea right he's he's leaned back in a pose of what i mean for a soldier and a proud kind of military man would be a relative pose of ease just kind of back with his drink chilling just like he's just kind of eh, you know all right just reading thinking about what's going on so i enjoy that concept of it now there are a few nitpicks I have with the artwork I suppose that we'll talk about. And if you can hear it in the background, there's the dum dum dum. This is nothing to do with the cards, guys. This is where where I am right now. There's some kind of Indian drum festival going on, and it keeps getting louder. I close the window. We're doing our best here. Anyways, let's talk about the minor nitpicks I have with the artwork. Because conceptually, I really like this card. But if you want to get really picky with it, which, I mean, I can't help myself. We're doing flavor here. If there's so much wind blowing these curtains... How is it not affecting that piece of paper in a sand? Like, look at the way the curtains are blowing and billowing inwards. So you know that the wind is coming in. Yet, he's holding a piece of paper that doesn't look super, super strong. That parchment, and it's bent towards him. Where clearly, the wind would be bending that another way. Another nitpick I have is this guy looks like a very a very meticulous style military man that even in this sort of sense of repose, even in the sense of like sitting with his cup of tea, there's almost like a a ready to spring up maneuver inside of him like a soldier's tense like a coil boom ready to go and or like a coiled spring i suppose is what i'm trying to say there so if you look at the positioning of the dagger held by the assassin it totally looks like it's far enough out that it would be in the view of this soldier from where he's sitting i mean if you look at the way the lights hitting the guy's face coming through and everything it totally looks like he would have a view of that dagger and the shadows and being a military man i assuming a higher level military man with intel of this nature I feel like it would be unlikely he would be caught this unawares. And also, it seems like a really rookie assassin move to have your blade that far. Like, there's no need to do that aside from the dramatic, how awesome it looks in the artwork. There's no need to actually do that. So, these are minor nitpicks, though, obviously. I mean, this is a game of fantasy. There will always be some issues. But overall, 
I genuinely enjoy the flavor of this card. And it got me thinking all the way back to the beginning of the game, as a lot of these things do. I've really been thinking a lot about the cards from like 1994 specifically, man. They, they're really nostalgic for me. So, we're going to talk about an old assassin, the Royal Assassin. Now, this is from the very beginning of the game, literally from Alpha. And it's two black and a colorless. I had revised edition ones. I love this guy. So, the Royal Assassin is fantastic. You can tap them to destroy any tapped creature. The flavor text is so good that they kept it even after they reprinted them. Trained in the arts of stealth, the Royal Assassins choose their victims carefully, relying on timing and precision rather than brute force. Now, I was lucky enough to win one of these Royal Assassins in a game of ante. And um, I was so stoked about it that I literally built a black deck to be able to use it. And I remember sitting there looking at it when it was in my hand or when it was on the table, and uh, I would just sit there staring, going, this guy looks so cool, like, he has the robes and everything, and like this weird little, almost like turban, or like cloth wrapped around his head, with like, a, almost like a jade eye patch or something, he just looks so distinct, and you can see that he's waiting outside, and like out behind, and in kind of an alley-ish area, near a town, not, not a town, sorry, a house, where reveling is going on, like there's a party, maybe there's nobles going on, but I really enjoyed the idea of this being a, an assassin employed by royalty, which means he's very skilled, he's worth a lot of money, you being served by him makes you royalty, which is obviously very cool as well, and I really enjoyed the idea of relying on timing and precision rather than brute force. So basically, Royal Assassin was uh, reprinted with some really cool artwork, honestly. When they reprinted him, they kept the same flavor text. They gave him some really funky artwork with this like white mask with one black radiating eye. And he's got this amazing cloak going on with this crazy leather band armor. And this very distinctive blade that he uses. That he, It's just, I really enjoy the artwork on the new Royal Assassin as well. And so what we're going to talk about is these eight cards we're going to talk about are going to be sorcery style Eight horrible ways to die, basically. And now we're talking specifically sorcery style, slow deaths, like somebody coming to assassinate you, as opposed to instant magical deaths, like with a terror spell. Like terror is a black and a colorless, and it destroys target non-black or non-artifact creature. It literally scares them to death. And that artwork on terror is so evocative. The use of negative space is very interesting. I mean, we'll talk about that on another day, but I just want to narrow down what we're going to be talking about. We're going to talk about eight horrible ways to go, specifically in a slow black sorcery fashion, okay? And the deadly visit made me think about Royal Assassin. Royal Assassin actually ties in to the assassin concept that we will see on multiple of these sorceries. Now, the first we're going to talk about is Assassinate, specifically, because it's the most straightforward, and it just ties into the card we talked about. So, one black and two colors, destroy target tapped creature, and the flavor text is, this is how wars are won. Not with armies of soldiers, but with a single knife blade, artfully placed. Urine, Royal Assassin. This is amazing. If you actually look at the blade, and you go back to the previous Royal Assassin that we just looked at, that's the blade that he has right there. On top of that, I love the fact that the you've got the black poison, I assume, is what's running off of the blade, but at the same time, it's coming out of his mouth, and it's dripping out around the one eye socket, which actually matches the Royal Assassin's mask. So this, this emulates the tap ability of a Royal Assassin, while also Artwork-wise, being type tapped directly into it, and the feeling of desolation. This this artwork is very brown. There's no there's no life anywhere in this picture. It's a very desolate, hopeless piece of art. It's a horrible way to go, and I absolutely love the flavor behind this. Magic has so much flavor, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to actually take a dive down into some commons and things like that. Because a lot of the time, people just want to focus on the rares and stuff. But all these cards have artwork commissioned for them, flavor designed. They all matter. So we're going to take a look at what's cool, boys, not what's rare all the time, all right? So Assassinate was the first one. Well, sorry, I guess Assassinate's technically the second one, because Deadly Visit counts as one of the eight, okay? Next up is Assassin's Strike. Now, this is similar to, obviously, Assassinate, but it doesn't care about tapping. It's six mana for Destroy Target Creature. Its controller discards a card. The flavor text says, When Celestia missionaries moved into the Shanov Quarter... They face scorn, ridicule, and ultimately martyrdom. Now, this is an interesting one to talk about because we're going back 
to Ravnica. Now you can see walking down this moonlit alley, you have the um, you have this high priest of the Celestians. You can tell from his headdress specifically, it actually has the Celestian tree on the top of it. So he's walking peacefully alone, also with his head down. The contrast between the two characters, right? You have him down, you have him with his head down, with his hands like in his robes. So basically, he is like he's unaware and he's going to be slow reacting. His hands aren't out ready to grab the blade that's about to come from, and he's not even looking up. For all for all we know, it could easily be a situation where he just walks by the assassin, the assassin steps out from behind him and slides the blade in. That's the level of unpreparedness that it shows. On top of that, the assassin is shown with his head up, both of his hands available, one placed against the wall, and one held up in preparedness with that tiny little blade obviously glowing to show you that it is magical and capable of doing the deal in one hit, right? Because that's the effective way you want to do it. With an assassin, you just want to get, as long as you can get one jab in there. I will admit that it is kind of funny to me that this dude, or possibly a lady, actually, you know, those shadow, look, might have shadowed breasts there, uh, has like a scorpion mask on that makes me think of Mortal Kombat. But I do also enjoy the contrast between the dark blue in the area where the old Celestian is and the kind of like reddish more violent energy on the other side because the the blue cold contrasted against like the warm more active energy on the other side that's the feel it gives me and guys i i, I never went to art school i don't know anything about any of this this is literally just how i feel when i look at the art so that's just me baby all right next up we're gonna talk about contract killing that is two black and three colorless destroy target creature create two colorless treasure artifact tokens with sacrifice this artifact to get a man of any color. And for a price, the floating city of High and Dry offers all the amenities a pirate could want. Rest, recreation, and revenge. Now this, this art doesn't depict the horrible part, right? This is the payment that's being made after it's taken place. So the creatures, in this artwork, the creature's already been destroyed and the payment is being made. Now this one is horrific to me simply because a contract, I mean pirates, Pirates aren't assassins. Assassins are going to come in real quick. And like the, the horror of assassination is just, you could just feel a tiny little poke and all of a sudden you're staring up at the sky as your eyes film over. Like, oh, that's horrifying. But a pirate, like if this is a pirate captain and they're sending their people in, like you don't know how fast it's going to be, how easy it's going to go. Are you going to get hacked apart with rusty blades? Like all that matters is that they get paid at the end, right? It's not about sending a message. It's just about getting that money. So... It's it's a very horrific thing to me. I find it it's not depicted that much in the artwork. Although I genuinely do enjoy the artwork, uh, in a way though it is kind of funny. It doesn't it doesn't look very um, it doesn't look very well. And the guy's looking off like he wants to be like, oh, nothing to see here. And they're just standing out in some street corner doing it out in the open. Here's the exchange. Here's your murder money. Seems a little foolish, but that's all right. Not not a huge deal. Now there are some that are a little less directly related to like assassin's blades and things like that so you've got things like asphyxiate which is from uh the the theros block and that's two black and a colorless and destroy target untapped creature so it's interesting it's different than the uh it's different than the assassinate that we looked at earlier and it's more like the concept of destroying an untapped creature is this guy's this guy's just asleep so he's not all worn out from attacking or anything like that the flavor text some poisons enter through the blood, some are ingested, some are inhaled. All ways through which mortals draw strength are paths for poison. That is a pretty flavorful bit of text there. And look at the artwork. You can see some kind of, assumable, it's assumably a priest of uh, Farika there from the flavor text, who has come in with some sort of container that is just dispensing this noxious, foul fumes that, by the way, are controlled to a degree because if you notice the trail of fumes is going directly over to this guy at the bed and has entered his body and you can already see how quickly it's affected him because he's he's jolted up but from how white his eyes are he's already near death as this this stuff just fills his lungs it doesn't even at this point it wouldn't even matter about the actual the poison it could just literally be filling your lungs with so much magical gas that there's no room for oxygen. It's not 100% here, but I enjoy the really the really dark purple 
way that the artwork is done. Kevin Walker is a really talented artist. He's done a lot of um, artwork for Magic, and he's one of the he's one of the few ones left that I feel really still has the the distinctive artwork. Where right when you see it, you know it's him. And I really enjoy the way that he's captured the lighting effect from the the little torch or light that's hanging up there right at the top of the artwork. You can see it reflecting on the wall and then down also through the mist and on his shoulder. It's really impressive. And this is a terrifying way to go. You wake up choking. And I mean, he's he's going in the other direction. Now, is that because he woke up and saw this and he's trying to flee from that person? Or did, is that just the direction that he woke up coughing and choking and he's never even going to see what's happened to him and his life's just already over? Like that, that's terrible and terrifying. And we've got another one in a, in a similar, well, a similar-ish vein from Theros, which is Sip of Hemlock, and this is assassination via poisoning. So, two black, four colors, destroy target creature, its controller loses two life. So, conspirators poisoned the oracle not because their visions were wrong, but because they were right. She knew too much, so she had to go. And then those noxious vapors, I assume, leaking out of the creature are what also damages your opponent. Like, look at that. You can see, you can see the noxious, like, hemlock fumes also coming up out of the cup. There's not liquid being spilled. There's the tiniest bit of black vapor leaching up out of the cup. As you can see, it also coming out of her mouth. Man, that's some super evocative artwork. I absolutely adore how well they're able to transmit the horror. What a terrible way to go. Good God. All right. So what else do we have left? Because we've talked about most of them. Well, let's talk about another one that is involving people forcing others to their doom. And that is Walk the Plank. Two black, destroy target non-merfolk creature. I absolutely love the flavor behind that, by the way. They make all kinds of black cards that destroy creatures, and it will be destroy target non-black creature. Destroy target once they did non-green creature. Uh, destroy target non-elf creature. Well, this one's fun because the non-merfolk makes perfect sense. You're going to try and make a merfolk walk the plank. What do you think is going to happen when they hit the water? How are you going to chain up their legs? They ain't got a legs. They got that big old tail, boy. So, the flavor text says, When Captain Thorn adds a new ship to his fleet, he gives the crew a simple choice. Follow me or fall in the sea. I really like the absolute simpl simplicity of this card. It's it's very straightforward, but it's also really horrific, right? I mean, the walking the plank is not a quick process. Look at this. They, they've got to bind you up with chains. Then they put the plank out. Then they slowly edge you out there. And top of that, they've thrown chum out into the water. If you're wondering why there are sharks circling like that in that one particular area, what they do is they just throw out a bucket of chum, which is essentially just fish guts and stuff. So it just fills the water with a bunch of blood. And then the sharks circle like crazy. So that's what, they're being chained up, so there's no way to swim away from them. And they're just tossed into the water with an insane amount of hungry sharks. Like, that's, that's insane. That's a horrible, horrible way to go. Just crazy. Now, the last one that I'm, I'm going to toss one extra in, actually. So I shouldn't say this is the last one, because we're going to talk about number eight. This should be number eight, but I have a bonus one that I tossed in at the end because it's a little bit different, but I still want to put it on the list. All right, so two black and three colors for Death's Caress. This one's crazy, all right? Now, this isn't, this isn't uh, obviously a human coming and doing it, but this isn't, um, this isn't like a terror spell and dying of magical fright or whatever. This is like an undead coming in. But this is the slow sort of sorcery style death that we're talking about with like poison or walking the plank as well because you can see she's lying in bed she's somewhere where she thought she was safe sleeping so this it's a sorcery destroy target creature if that creature was a human you gain life equal to its toughness so it's if, if it's a human it gets eaten as well the faint smell of cloves the rustling of the wind and a paralyzing descent into an airless fathomless tomb guys that flavor text plus the artwork, oh man, the way, like the fact that they chose to make the skeletal hand all red. Now it's not dripping with blood, but it does give that very violent, like blood covered kind of feel. And the fact that it's completely red makes you just think, it's just, it's a more intense version of a skeleton, like a demonic skeleton. And the sheer look, like the, the, the eyes, her eyes, they say so much. This is very, very scary to me. I absolutely love it. Imagine that's what wakes you up. 
that just feeling you might you might have feared the slightest clatter that registers in your brain as something else and then boom there's a skeletal face a skeletal hand on your face your eyes pop open and then boom, night light right back to lights out that is just intense so I said that there was a bonus card, so I do want to talk about that bonus card. And that's Eliminate the Competition. This is a sorcery creature kill spell from uh, the Kaladesh block. It's five mana. You sacrifice X creatures to destroy X target creatures. And open hostilities are strictly forbidden at the Inventor's Fair, but accidents help. And the flavor decks doesn't do much for me, but the concept behind the card, where you're sacrificing creatures to get rid of your opponent's creatures, and when you look at the artwork and see that the assassin has reached out and grabbed the target's wrist, and then driven the blade straight down through their hand to ensure that the poisoned blade kills the target, knowing that the assassin will die as well from the poison on the blade, that to me is intensely horrifying like it's one thing to have an assassin who's paid to take you out or anything like that right but it's another to have an assassin that is going to end you and themselves at the same time and it's horrific on another level because this assassin isn't being bribed into this isn't being paid for this this assassin is being magically compelled to take themselves down it's absolutely incredibly horrifying so I want, to, I want to hop back to Desk Rest for just one second because in the future, we are going to talk about how cards like this couldn't have existed for a very interesting reason. If you find that to be interesting and you want to know more, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you're hanging out and you get to hear all the magical knowledge I have for you. Now, let's check in with the sixth color of magic. Hello, I'd like to say hello to you guys. This is Minion Chris and congratulate uh, MTG Purple on the increase of followers, and just like it's been yesterday, remembering first heard of you, it was the wizard what got me. Now we have MTG Purple, Perp, and you have the boss monster, which is hilarious. Can't wait for him to go off again on somebody. And now you're Magic Historian. My friend, if you get any more names, we're going to need four scrolls just to start naming them off. Um, just want to say, uh, it's been great watching everything you've done, and together we are the Six Color of Magic. Have a good night. Oh yeah, Six Color of Magic is always my favorite part of the episode. If you haven't sent a clip in yet, my friends, please uh, do so. Now comes the part where we roll the scroll. The names of all the glorious people who help support my channel on Patreon. Thank you all so very much. It's very meaningful what you do to help me. So what's up next? Do you want more videos like this? Because there's about 50 of them right over here. Get in there. Or you want something a little bit different. I have another channel with amazing funny stuff. Get over there. Watch me suffer. And I'm history, baby.